I would like to begin by acknowledging with respect the history, the customs, and the culture of the Coast Salish and Salish peoples on whose traditional lands we are today. It is a real privilege to be able to work on this traditional territory, and we carry out our work here in the spirit of respect and caring for those traditions. So thank you all for joining us today for the Women's Scholar Lecture Series of this year. This series in, is intended to bring distinguished women scholars to the University of Victoria, and it's a tradition that's been carried on here for many years now. The main criterion in selecting a candidate is scholarly excellence, and I think many here our distinguished speaker today who will agree that um, we have chosen well. We're grateful to the University of Victoria for providing this opportunity for the funding to bring in a, a distinguished speaker. I would also like to thank the partners and the sponsors of this event, including uh, the School of Nursing, represented by Dr. Noreen Frisch, the director of the school. Noreen, do you want to just a little way? I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Ann Bruce, who was um, the acting director while Noreen was on sabbatical, and Ann kind of was part of the group that started this. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the School of Public Health and Social Policy, represented by Dr. Michael Hayes, who's the director there. And I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Maureen Shields, who's somewhere here in the audience. Uh, Maureen, who actually, um, Maureen and I last year, we kind of cooked up the idea for this together, and then she went off on sabbatical, and Michael got to carry it through, so thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the Center for Aboriginal Health Research, represented by Director Charlotte Redding, who's over here, and in a moment she'll introduce our speaker. And um, the CIHR Applied Public Health Research Chair at the University of Victoria, which um, is represented by myself, Marjorie McDonald. I'm a professor in the School of Nursing here at the University. Uh, I'd also um, like to thank the First Peoples House, for who have provided this extraordinarily beautiful and very appropriate setting for this, for this event. So now I'm going to turn it over to Charlotte who will introduce our guest. Thanks, Marjorie. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to see you, and I'm so excited um, that I'm just going to read what I have to say. Otherwise, I'll be here all day extolling the virtues of Adam the Stout. Um, I'm a professor here in the School of Public Health and Social Policy, the director of the Center for Aboriginal Health Research, and um, a Mi'kmaq person um, uh, from Nova Scotia. And so I've been given the great honor of introducing one of the most remarkable people uh, that I know, Madeline Dion Stout. She was born and raised in Cahiwin, Cahiwin First Nation in um, Alberta. She attended Blue Quills Residential School there. Uh, after graduating from the Edmonton General Hospital as a registered nurse, uh, she earned a bachelor's degree in nursing with distinction from the University of Lethbridge, and then a master's degree in international affairs from the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. She has served on several Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal uh, committees, including um, the Resolution uh, Health Support Advisory Committee for Health Canada, First Nations Health Authority of BC, and has been involved in several um, health research projects, uh, most of them funded through the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. She was the president of the Aboriginal Nurses Association of Canada, a member of the National Forum on Health, in, and in August 2007, she was appointed to the Mental Health Commission of Canada as an inaugural uh, vice chair of their board of directors. She was a professor in, the, in Canadian Studies and the founding director of the Center for Aboriginal Education, Research and Culture at Carleton University in Ottawa. And now that she has retired, <laughs> not really, um, she's continuing to work as, um, as a researcher, as a writer, as a lecturer in First Nations, Inuit and Métis Health. And she has been uh, increasingly adopting a Cree lens in her work. She received the, and I'm not going to say this right, Isini Wicca Meek. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, award uh, from the Aboriginal Nurses Association of Canada, uh, Distinguished Alumnus Award from the University of Lethbridge, 
an honorary doctor of laws from UBC and the University of Ottawa. In November of 2008, the Canadian Nurses Association selected Madeline uh, for the Centennial Award, which was given to 100 outstanding Canadian nurses. And in March 2010, she, uh, she received the National Aboriginal Achievement Award in the health category. And I was honored to attend that event. And I can tell you that, as always, Madeline was breathtaking. Um, so on a personal note, I just want to add that as an Aboriginal woman, um, and a health scholar, and a researcher, um, Madeline has been uh, not just one of my role models. She has been my role model. She didn't know that but she was. Um, I began reading her work in the 1990s, and I've had the pleasure of hearing her speak on several occasions, and, and more recently, I've got to know her personally. Uh, but I remember many years ago, uh, I was gathered around her, as most of us always did after her talks, to try to glean another pearl of wisdom from her, and she said, as Aboriginal women, we are organic researchers because we have lived the experiences that we seek to explore. That resonated with me. It took, it took root with me, and I decided then that that's what I was going to do. And while her achievements are outstanding, um, it is the manner in which she goes about doing her work, right? Her, her commitment, her strength, uh, her mentorship, her humility, most of all, and her unfailing love for our people that really inspires me. So, with much love and devotion, <laughs> please join me in welcoming Madeline Young. Nations Thank you, one and all, for taking time to be together tonight to think upon Tradition is more modern than modern is. I would also like to thank all the other the people who huddled together many months ago to convince the funders to have someone like me here tonight. Can I ask them? No, I got you the School of Nursing, Mike Shop, and CIHR, and um, of course Carr. We are on these territories while we look at tradition being more modern than modern is. In other words, what is old is new again. But tradition and modern modernity, the old and new, have to be examined in evolving living contexts and must be a faithful reflection of the lives that are lived there. And tradition and modernity have to find expression in places like the University of Victoria. Above all, both the old and new have to be sought out and fought out in the spirit of health and wellness for Indigenous peoples and all our friends and families. 
I am deeply honored to have this opportunity to share my stories, experiences, and learnings on the links between the old and new in nursing, public health, and Indigenous knowing and doing. In each discipline, the old and new, that is tradition and modernity, can exist alone, coexist, or override one another, depending on our situation, how we internalize change, and how we perceive one another. Let me begin by sharing two personal nursing stories with old and new sides and origins. In May 2000, a doctor's strike was in full force in Alberta. During this disruption in services, my 88-year-old mother, Nutuguel, old lady, was shuttled from one site to another complaining. I feel like my chest has exploded. First, she was taken from the seniors lodge on my reserve community to a hospital nearby. From there, she was transferred back to the seniors lodge because of the doctor's strike. Finally, when her symptoms did not subside, she was admitted to a second hospital in another town. On her deathbed there, she was given a sponge bath by a non-Aboriginal nurse in the presence of my niece, who is also a nurse. In her best English, my mother asked, her non-Aboriginal nurse, am I low? In her best bedside manner, the nurse answered my mother, no, Mrs. Dion, your bed is just the right height. My mother, Nutiguel, was clearly thinking in Cree when she asked the nurse whether she was low. In Cree, is to ask, am I low? But the subtext is always, am I dying? Without proper cultural knowledge, it was very easy for my mother's nurse to miss this new nuance in the year 2000. Nutiguel, my mother, was dying in a modern setting where her mother tongue was not valued and valorized for its true grit. Cree is collective, gender neutral, verb based, and full of original instructions. In this situation, modernity overrode tradition at a most critical and vulnerable stage of life, elderhood. Indeed, modernity trumped tradition and peoplehood at once. When I seared into my consciousness an image of Nutiguel, a woman and mother, who was silenced even while receiving end-of-life care, I know viscerally that her day had come as surely as it never did. On her deathbed, my mother raised her singing voice to the animate drum. Who sang her home? And straightened her failing body to the sacred moment. This scenario, situation, shows me unequivocally that tradition is indeed more modern than modern is. 
I would like to share another nursing story I've lived. My fever, sore abdomen, and retching alarmed my mother enough for my father to hitch the horses up. Together, we drove 10 miles by wagon to the hospital where I had my appendix removed. My uncle Alphonse had died from a ruptured appendix just before I was born. So when I started manifesting his symptoms, my parents knew what to do. On the way to the hospital, we drove in the ditch because we did not quite make the grade with our horse-drawn wagon against the fancy cars and trucks on the highway. From our path less traveled, we could only cross the highway to get to the other ditch. I lay in the wagon box as a little seven-year-old, bearing witness to my dignified, inscrutable help-seeking caregivers who seemed oblivious to being relegated to the margins. I like to think my mother and father's traditional repose was because they were at the center of an alternative wellness project and a very possible mission accomplished. At a most impressionable time of my life, my parents' corporal act of mercy saved my life and exposed me to the corresponding energy of nurses in winged hats and crisp white dresses, whose ranks I would join some 12 years later and whose tender loving care I still bask in 60 years later. Tradition overrode modernity here because Geteya, the old ones, balanced the health development equation by taking extremely good care of Oskayak, the new ones. Even though ditches are usually seen as toxic, deadly, and extreme, using them as life-giving sources and supports pushes them to rarefied heights while marginalized people are pulled into a higher order. I will now fast forward to my 40th year as a nurse, to the year 2000, when the Canadian Nurses Association celebrated 100 years of leadership for registered nurses in Canada. These centennial celebrations resonate very strongly with me because I was one of the 100 outstanding nurses who was awarded a centennial award by the CNA at the time. I can only attribute this accomplishment to the wagon loads of survival instincts my mother and father drove into me as a child. My father hunted to feed us many a raw deer leg bone, which when cracked in half, exposed the bone marrow we dug out and feasted on with the sticks my grandfather had whittled. My mother's constant reminder, where she hook, instructed us to adorn ourselves as luxuriously as nature would, so we could move with it in stealth and presence. To shift to the topic of public health, I will share a story my grandfather told many times to my siblings and me as we sat in rapture at his feet. The story goes, a very lethal pathos had seized a creek camp by a lake's edge. 
only two young brothers survived the disease that had rubbed out everyone else. A homemade ball was the only material possession that meant anything to the brothers. One day, as they tossed it back and forth to one another by the lake, a lone canoeist pulled up alongside and scooped up the ball they had lost control of. When the canoeist gestured as if to give it back, the older brother went for the ball, but was abducted and paddled swiftly out of range and sight. As the younger brother frantically ran around the shoreline in desperate pursuit of his one and only constant companion, he wailed out his pathetic weakness in aloneness, and he cried out for a merciful transformation to a wolf. Nistesi, nistesi, kiam gamahi ganuin. Woo, 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 woo. Older brother, older brother, never mind, I will myself into a wolf. Woo, 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 woo. My grandfather's predictive and instructive legend speaks volumes about the rampant smallpox and typhoid fever that prompted some visionaries to start the Canadian Public Health Association in 1910. It also points out that public health must be considered historically, taking into account casually related events that pile up over time. Not surprisingly today, public health is focused on disease prevention and the health needs of populations as a whole. The conference that marked CPHA's 100th anniversary in 2010 was titled Public Health in Canada, Shaping the Future Together, June 13, 2010. A centennial panel opened this conference and trace the major milestones in the development of national health policy. I was one of the centennial panelists only because Mary Simon, um, Sean Atlio, and George Erasmus had declined the invitation. I was one of the centennial panelists by default, along with the Honorable Mark Lalonde, Honorable Monique Beger, Honorable Jake Epp, and Honorable Roy Romano. When he was Minister of National Health and Welfare from 1972 to 1977, the Honorable Mark Lalonde received international acclaim for the 1974 policy document a new perspective on the health of Canadians. As minister from 1977 to 1984, Honorable Monique Beger led the passage and implementation of the Canada Health Act. Honorable Jacobs tenure as minister from 1984 to 1989 was marked by the 1986 Ottawa Chapter for Health Promotion that prepared for the report of the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health in 2008. As Premier of Saskatchewan from 1991 to 2001, the Honourable Roy Romano introduced a regional health system and later chaired the Royal Commission on the Future of Healthcare in Canada. As the commoner panelist among these preeminent health leaders, I addressed First Nations, Inuit and Métis health issues by taking issue with the ill-fated Kelowna Accord 
and by situating my talk in a death and dance story. The story goes like this. When my mother was a very young mother, she attended a sun dance. And after she got off the wagon with her little troop of children, she stopped in at Nitik's tent. Nitik was in her 80s and she was blind. When my mother entered her tent, Nitik turned to my mother and said, Hey, hey, new system, that will mistake it. Hey, hey, my granddaughter, I am so happy that you have crossed my threshold and you have let the cool breezes in. It was a very hot summer day. As she cleaned her moccasins, Nitik who was over 80 years old and blind, said to my mother, In time to come, she told my mother, as she cleaned her moccasins, dancing will be everyone's vocation. Witness idle no more. At the same time, she said, we will die to the point of extinction. That's a real story based on facts. And again, so predictive and so instructive. In Cree, our word for Dance is nimituin, to move rhythmically. In Cree, our word for death is punawaskawiwin, to stop moving. To set indigenous knowing and doing in, tra in a tradition and modern context, I will tell you about the first researcher and the first example of participatory action research I ever encountered. My grandfather, Salomo Young Chief, charted the sun's morning rays where they first hit our humble kitchen wall using the screen door I'd watched him build as his gauge. Many pencil lines with Cree syllabics decorated our wall at the end of my grandfather's fastidious study. All the pencil marks documented data, information, and knowledge my grandfather and the son had gathered with the help of a ready and relevant instrument, the screen door. The syncretic knowledge my grandfather possessed proved that grandfather the sun rises in the east, Sagastenok, is halfway and full in the south, Apitagiskanok. It sets in the west, Paksimotak, and is a homing force in the north, Kiwetunuk. On Easter morning, my grandfather had us watch the sun dance through the tiny but vital matrices in the screen door. He measured metaphors through these matrices while deploying his imagination as the precursor to knowing and doing. In his research, he stood on tradition for authority and sat on modernity for power. Enter the Center for Aboriginal 
health research car at the University of Victoria, where a dedicated space has been created for essential researchers, partners, and activities to address the urgent health disparities faced by First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples in Canada. CAR's goal is to improve the health and well-being of Aboriginal peoples through community-based research and knowledge translation with the highest standards of Indigenous and Western methodologies and ethics. <coughs> CAR would have us know that education is the road to success when it gets poured into you. It would also have us know that the road to success is educated when it pours out of you. Therefore, the scholastic and research achievements, it promotes are both inspirational and influential. The relatively new face at the University of Victoria, 2008, knows the paramountcy of tradition, even as it takes into account modernity. Devoted parents, partners, progeny, and peers fill in the abysses of the real unknowns at CAR, where the true data warriors are born. To get to the First Nations Health Authority and its focus on wellness and personal responsibility as a key health determinant, I'll quickly share one last story about how my father and other men from my home community maintained our log house, the one they had built together from scratch. Every fall, they would winterize it while the horses tugged and pulled the stone boat stone boat being a flat wooden slat on skids that was loaded with heavy wet clay held together with straw. The men would throw this clay and straw mixture or mud chinking expertly into the gaps between the logs, smoothing it between us and the harsh cold of winter with their bare hands and then they would whitewash it for a wagon trail appeal. When the mud chinking dried, I would, as discreetly as possible, eat it after spitting out the bitter whitewash I later knew to be laced with lead. In nursing school, I found out that dirt contains iron and other minerals. And more recently, I was made aware that environmentally friendly houses like my log home now sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. The moral of this story is to be very careful how we name poverty and poor people and how we weigh tradition against modernity, especially when we look close up at the First Nations Health Authority, a leading, innovative, indigenous health organization in Canada. The First Nations vision is healthy, self-determining, and vibrant BC First Nations children families and communities. The First Nations Health Authority is a longhouse that unlike this room in the making that will be maintained by a wellness framework for the totality of self and the entirety of environments constantly recheck themselves 
while providing respite on people's journeys to health through wellness. The rainbow colors in the First Nations Health Authority wellness model reminds me of the two Cree names we have for a rainbow, Pismoeapi, meaning a life stream of sun, and Kimuonapi, meaning a life stream of rain. These concepts are steeped in tradition, yet born of modernity. They are opposites, but they are not polarizing. They are equal, but not the same. Not unlike the First Nations Health Authority that is being written into history because of its emphasis on wellness with human beings at the center. I hope you do take the time to look on the website to learn more about the First Nations Health Authority because it is a very exciting and fascinating, can I say fascinating, um, project, alternative project to wellness. Thank you for your time, energy, and interest. Thank you for hearing me, and hopefully we can have a chin wag <laughs> over tea or something. Hi, I'm going to ask you, no, merci beaucoup.